Yeah, thank you very much for having the opportunity for me to present my work. I'm very extremely new to the community of a dynamical system. It all started with a working group during the pandemic. So a group of us, as you can list here, Lavanda Vakarian, uh, Elisa Nigurini, Robin Martin, uh, Mayanna Pasha and myself, we form a working group. And most of us actually are very new to dynamical system, but we have more or like less some tools, for example, from optimal transport or from other type of inverse problem or mean field games. And we want to kind of work together to find a problem. And Robert Martin, I would say, the leading person to give us this problem and give us a lot of intuition about dynamical systems. Uh, so then after talking a year on Zoom, later we have a paper and right now is uh, to appear in CIDS. Um, and okay, actually most of them I have never met. And I only met Robert Martin last Wednesday for the first time after collaborating for the entire one and a half years. So it's a very interesting, like, uh, experience and I still the rest three of them I only know them in two dimensional space and then right now uh, I also have the follow up work with a student at Cornell uh, Jonah Bertmik Greenhouse that is continuing this long work and still we are at a very starting point and there's a lot of problem and question that we wish to answer in the next few years okay so I think it's similar to the majority of the talks in this workshop we want to learn dynamical systems and for me, I have some basic uh, training in typical inverse problem like inverse conductivity, the dark in the Darcy flow, and that's what we know as Cardinal problem, or inverse scattering from Hamho's perspective, or waveform inversion from the uh, geophysical community. So when I look at this problem, uh, when we were told by Rob, it is like a standard inverse problem. Um, you are given data, and the data are the trajectories you measure at T0, T1, may not be equally spaced. And now you have a model which is kind of well defined, like for example, this uh, Lawrence 63 system. And the starting point was if I have those measurements, x0, t0, all the way to like how many data tra uh, tracker samples I have, can I recover the, full, uh, the three uh, physical parameters, sigma, rho, and beta? And I know they have actually their physical meanings, and that's how Lawrence uh, first derived those mod uh, models. Okay. And in most of the situations, unless you really have to restrict yourself to this toy model, your parameter doesn't have to be these three physical models. Like it can be like in the previous talk, can be physical models, but it can be something that we create a model, more or less like a parameterization. So in this uh, talk, we have polynomial basis, and then your parameter in that basis become polynomial coefficients. But in many other uh, like situation, also I've seen some other works that you parameterize the right hand side, not about global polynomials. Maybe you worry about the wrong phenomenon. You may want to parameterize them by piecewise polynomials, and that gives you a different type of basis. And again, you have coefficients or RD, RBF or Fourier basis, etc. And then in this respect, we really have a big pool of parameterizations, and which one you choose has a lot to do with your regularization in the sense we in which hypothesis space you are looking for your right-hand side. And this is really like, like user-infused uh, type of hypothesis. And also, uh, both polynomials and the other basis function, at least here, they are linear parameterization. In the sense that if I parameterize my right-hand side by those type of basis, I get a, a times x or a times v, that type of uh, like a structure, so I, it's a linear parameterization. So we can represent as a matrix vector uh, multiplication. But nowadays, like in the past several uh, years, the nonlinear parameterization also gain a ground, and in some aspect, it has like more advantageous features in terms of especially high-dimensional object. So no matter which one is your favorite parameterization or which space is your favorite space, in the end, you want to find a coefficient or parameters given your particular parameterization, and then it comes to in the uh, same framework it is an inverse problem. And the inverse problem, we cannot really talk about inverse problem by itself. It always go hand in hand with the forward problem. So first of all, you need to identify what is a forward problem, and we should understand all the nice properties of the forward problem. So in this particular case, if we stay with the uh, dynamical system, the forward problem is you tell me what is the first guess of sigma rho beta, and I'm going to solve the dynamical system and I'll, I'll, I'll obtain my synthetic time trajectory. And then 
I try to match the difference between the synthetic time trajectory versus what I observe, and that gave me a misfit, and that goes into your loss function, and this is like a feedback loop to help you to decide what will be my correction in the next step. And the inverse problem is correspondingly given the data, and I will try to find the time trajectories. So that's a standard framework. But as long as we try to proceed in this framework, there are certain properties that we do not like, especially in the forward process. The first is a chaotic feature, and this is something uh, very known as the butterfly effect, um, as we learn like chaotic system as a one-on-one -one, uh, fact. So we have the Lorentz uh, uh, system has a very chaotic parameter of sigma rho beta uh, coupling, and now I only have an initial condition, very uh, a deviation by very epsilon type of perturbation, like 0 0.01, but after many time steps, then the trajectory uh, started to deviate from each other by a lot. So this is what we observe from like comparing trajectories perspective. Ah, now I see a huge difference. Then if we just look at data by itself, we may think, oh, this must be the big difference caused by my incorrect rho beta sigma. However, this is not the source of the problem. The source of the problem is purely the initial condition and is up to epsilon perturbation. In most of the numerical, uh, uh, discretization, you cannot avoid discretization error, you cannot avoid noise, and but this has nothing to do with the right hand side of the OD. And the second challenge, which is like first thought, is if what if there's a noise? And if there's a noise and I compare trajectories pointwisely, again, I can see big deviation. And when I see big deviation, I don't know what was the source of it. Is that really noise, or is it because my parameterization is not good, or is it because like the, my right hand side is there some incorrect uh, coefficient I need to update, and that will cause overfitting as well. No matter if it is measurement noise or the intrinsic noise in the right hand side of it itself. Okay. And the third challenge is sampling. So let's say in real world situation you have a, a like a, a measurement machine and it's doing the sampling and when we sample the dynamics we probably don't know the underlying dynamics so it it's possible that when we get the data we are not sampling fast enough because we have no notion what is supposed to be fast enough so it could be something like what we see on the right hand side we sample like the blue points but the underlying dynamics is the, uh, the green trajectory and since we are not sampling fast enough the velocity we approximate by the standard divided difference will not be accurate enough for us to really matching the velocity. So that's another difficulty if, uh, if the data is not good enough quality for us to really uh, uh, to estimate the Lagrangian velocity. So given the three challenges, we're thinking is there, an, and these three challenges all come from something has nothing to do of the right hand side. It comes from your measurement, it comes from the chaotic system itself. So we try to see if there's anything more stable compared to this a lot of trajectory data, and especially if I'm dealing with chaotic systems. And the feature was the main idea that we came up with. There is a stable uh, statistical property, and that is related to occupation measure, environment measure, physical measure in different uh, definitions. So the idea is very simple. I do have a lot of trajectory data, but instead of thinking the data by looking at them in like the time coordinate, I'm trying to find a measurement, and the measurement is basically the indicator function. So the indicator function, uh, yesterday we saw a lot of this in the, uh, in the line of Kuhlman operators. So you can think this measurement is purely indicator function, whether this trajectory is in set B or not. So the output is either one or zero. And now I have a lot of them, so I can define this occupation measure basically being among all of the, like, like say, a, a million samples I have, how many of them are inside B and how many of them are not? So that give me uh, basically uh, create a, a occupation measure. And this occupation measure is, uh, is a higher level or statistical quantity that I extract out of the trajectories. And in some assumptions, for example, where the initial condition should be that it is related to the physical measure and the physical measure under some conditions will be exactly the uh, SRB measure. And there's a lot of theory about them. So the key idea of this approach is instead of really treating trajectory point wisely and try to match them in time domain, 
which I cannot trust since um, there's some, so many other factors that can, can uh, lead to into uh, misfit. So we are going to take the mu star as observation data. And the mu star is our physical measure. But the physical measure can only be obtained when t going to infinity. So as an approximation to the physical measure, we use the occupation measure, which is the fourth equation that you can uh, directly uh, extract from your data. So that's how we deal with the data. Now we have a type of a new data rather than the set of uh, trajectory samples, we have an occupation measure. Now the next question is, what is the model? Originally, we do have an ODE model, we have ODE data, and now we have a new measure. So we also need to create a model that is efficient for me to repeatedly evaluate it, the occupation measure. Because each time is not very efficient, I simulate a long time trajectory and then accumulate the occupation measure. Now I change the parameter again, I do the long time trajectory and accumulate the occupation measure. That process takes a long time. So I want a short and a faster surrogate model for me to evaluate this. And that comes to later, we will see uh, there's a very nice connection to the PD side. And this is an illustration of whether you have no noise with <coughs> intrinsic noise or extrinsic noise in your uh, trajectory, and they visually look the same. And that's the effect of we are extracting the static quantities rather than looking at them pointwise. Okay, now we come to the model side. So this one, what I have as a force equation, it is basically the definition of a physical measure and given some assumption on the initial condition because the initial condition based on whether it should be from a positive Lebesgue measure or it should be over some atmosphere in the domain, then you have either the physical or the environmental side. But anyway, uh, if we wave our hand, we look at this definition. Now, since f is any cc infinity type function, so why not I choose f as the grad v times v? v is exactly our right hand side of the like a dynamical system, and the v is another cc infinity function. So this uh, multiplication still give me a cc infinity function. So I can plug in this particular f into the definition of the physical measure. And then on the left hand side, uh, we, oh, sorry, this is basically the left hand side that we moved here. Uh, and the right hand side come from the left hand side of this one. So we plug in here and do a change over, uh, basically do a change over and do an integration, we get absolutely zero. So that means for any CC infinity function, our V satisfy this equation. And that with the right hand side being zero with mu star, being our environmental measure. So this actually tells us the relationship between the uh, a physical measure versus my right-hand side of my uh, ODE. So what does that mean if we just make it a little bit more explicit? It tells that the physical measure you obtain is the stationary distributional solution to the continuity equation. So this is different from the relationship between ODE and uh, the continuity equation on a time scale. Because here, I don't have the measurement of rho uh, here, yeah, rho. At every time, I only have the measurement kind of approximately at the invariant side. And the invariant side will be treated as a stationary distributional solution. And that give me a model, because now whenever I have a candidate V, I can solve the forward problem to get my candidate rho. And now I compare the rho that I get from this model versus the rho that I really measure out of the trajectory to see their differences and now I have a feedback loop to update the parameter in my velocity state. So now we have a new model. To just summarize the idea, so our goal originally was to learn the right-hand side of a dynamical system. And what we extract from the data is the occupation measure. It's kind of a zero order type of statistics from it. And that occupation measure, I assume on those assumptions, is a good approximation to the physical measure. And we know the physical measure is a stationary distribution of the uh, continuity equation. So on the right hand side you see is basically the Lorentz system if I have the sample long enough and what it's like. And this is the occupation uh, the approximation to the physical measure we get. So instead of treating the problem really uh, from ODE level, ODE data to ODE model, well, now we can think about it from a PD data to a PD model. So now the modeling is no longer the dynamical system, but uh, the continuity equation as the constraint. And uh, the inverse problem will be, now I have the uh, occupation measure 
can I find the best coefficient in the continuity equation such that it match my reference? So this is basically the main idea of this line work. Okay, and now once we turn to the PD construct optimization, there have been a lot of very uh, mature techniques uh, from the last several decades on how to solve PD construct optimization. So there's a lot of mature tools available. So the problem now we have is I have the rho star, which is my observed occupation measure converted from the trajectories versus rho of theta. Subject two, the constraint come from this. Rho of theta need to be the stationary uh, solution <laughs> to the continuity equation. And now I have uh, the diffusion part in a dotted line in the sense that it can be added to model the additional noise. So it's a modeling assumption or a regularization if you think there's a lot of intrinsic noise uh, for the original PD. So the uh, data and the forward problem are totally changed, but the parameter V actually remains the same. So that's why we have a different uh, framework to do the parameter identification. Uh, this is more stable compared to uh, in, the, uh, in the ODE perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. So right now we just use it by some like, prior knowledge, well, we'll try and error to see which one is the best. Uh, and uh, one thing to realize is because we are in the stationary, uh, stationary side, uh, the constant, uh, there is actually a scalar uh, coupling between V and uh, the diffusion. So it's up to a scalar coupling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, in the dynamics, in the trajectory. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean observation? So, Ah, that's a very good question. So that you mean the extrinsic noise or intrinsic noise? Extrinsic noise. So this doesn't really account for the extrinsic noise. That's very true. Uh, there are some things that we try to see. Um, yeah, here is probably, so one way to control the extrinsic noise is the choice of the objective function. You can choose something that is kind of noise stable in the sense, for example, with the Wasserstein distance I will show. Another thing is because the definition for the occupation measure is already a summation and average. So that's the second way to kind of tackle the extrinsic noise. Yeah, if it's zero mean, then it's, I think it will work a lot better. Yeah. So, okay, so it's relatively more stable, but it's on court. <coughs> okay. So next, I want to just mention uh, why it is nice. In, now we are in the old, uh, PDE framework. So in any PDE constraint optimization, you always need to solve the forward problem. And very annoyingly, you need to solve it again and again because you need to do optimization. So in solving the old, uh, forward problem, we basically just solve a divergence equation, divergence of V rho equal to zero. But remember, we, the, the connection is only in the distributional sense. So it's not advocating to use any um, like finite difference or finite element type of method to solve this equation. Uh, the best candidate is on especially how we get this equation is finite volume method. Because in finite volume method, the solution meaning is already mass per cell. So the meaning of the solution is already on the weak side. And also you can only con prove convergence of a finite volume solution to the original PD solution in the distributional side. Okay. So once we discretize the divergence operator by, some, for example, first old Alvin scheme that conserve positivity and the mass conservation, it become m rho equal to rho with the fact that you have constraint since there, this doesn't give us any scalar multiplication. So you can constrain that rho uh, summation need to equal to one. So you, that one, then you make it unique. And what's more interesting is m on the linear algebra side is a Markov matrix row stochastic, uh, column, sorry, column stochastic. But on the other hand, it's also related to something we heard about yesterday that it is prime for business operator. It's basically map row from this um, time step to the next time step, except in this scenario, I'm only interested in the steady state. So I want to solve this uh, eigenvalue, eigenvector problem with I know the eigenvalue being exactly one. And you can also regularize a little bit. So earlier I say adding the diffusion part is one way to regularize it. And adding this teleportation regularization is another way to regularize it. So I think both approaches try to boost um, the conditioning of the matrix and also sometimes to guarantee uniqueness. 
So finally, uh, the solution to M rho equal to rho can be done by sparse linear algebra based on how we build up this Markov matrix M. Okay, so uh, I think I will go quick about the optimal transfer data fitting, and this is really my specialty rather than dynamical system. So optimal transport is a new tool recently to use uh, for, um, I think, in many scenarios. The original problem come from Munch, and the original problem, even nowadays, is basically a mass transportation. You have a pair of mass, F, and you have another pair of mass of G, and we are interested in of moving from one to the other. And there's numerous, there are infinite many ways you can do this arrangement. The, we are interested in, for example, the optimal way in some uh, cost function, so we will see later. And in the recent, I would say, two decades, it become more and more interesting, and a lot of applications started to use this tool in image processing, machine learning, inverse problem, and also model reduction for hyperbolic systems. Uh, and it's also related to the Martian power equation from differential geometry, and also because of uh, the JKO paper, it's also connected to the whole field of kinetic theory. And it can be used to solve those equations or analyze the gradient flow, et cetera. So the idea and also why it's kind of a better candidate to compare uh, distribution function is it's indeed accommodate the geo uh, geometry feature between distributions. When we have two objects, two density functions, for example, not the same, the way the rushes and distance and the uh, optimal transport problem care about it is I want to have a push forward map to make them the same. And once I have a push forward map, now I'm going to measure the map in the sense two directions. One is the vertical direction about the amount you move, multiply the distance you move. And the multiplication of these two is really make it unique, unique more than L2 or LP type of comparison, and also more unique than just cross correlation or phase space, because the definition itself is always two direction. And the definition here, you can also see in the integrand, F represents the mass you lift, and the X minus T of X represents the horizontal shift, and the cost is really this being this guy being the integrand. Uh, most used case will be P equal to one and two. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but there has been a lot of uh, studies in that, it, especially for the continued dependence between your parameter and the row, if it's something global, geometric, the measures and distance will provide a much better optimization landscape for those inverse problems. And another aspect is people understand where W sits in the classical uh, functional spaces. So it sits very close to the H minus one semi-norm. So we, type of, we kind of know how weak it is in the sense uh, about its um, robustness to noise because any weak norm will have a certain regularization or like tolerance regarding the noisy data. And that's also what we observe here. So finally, we can go through uh, examples. The framework we do the inverse problem is exactly the PD construct optimization. You solve the forward, you compute the objective function, you solve the adjoint, then you compute the gradient. So this framework is classic called the adjoint state method because in this framework, you can tackle no matter what the size of theta. It, even if it's no matter three or it's 10,000, you always only need to solve two PDEs to compute the gradient and to do the optimization. So next, I just go through some examples. Uh, so this is the first example we started, that you want to find the three parameters in the Lorentz system. The initial attractor is the red one, and the ground truth is the green, and the, what we reconstruct is the blue. So the attractor which we reconstruct is close to the ground truth. And we can also level it up to different type of parameterizations, especially neural network parameterization. Uh, because it gives me certain regularity that a piecewise constant or piecewise linear will not be able to. And also, if I discretize the velocity in a mesh-based domain, piecewise constant and piecewise uh, linear, for example, will give me a much larger dimension of theta compared to neural network. Because neural network parameterizes the coefficient function on the function level rather than on the discretization level. So this is actually uh, Isaka data uh, in, uh, in Cornell. <laughs> Uh, Isaka, New York. Um, so we have this temporary data from 2006 to two, uh, 2022. So it's a one dimensional time series. So what we did at the beginning is the same as the, what as have been mentioned multiple times, the taken theorem. So we do a time delay embedding. And once you do a time delay embedding, you have a two dimensional object. And now we can do the learning in the time delayed coordinate. So first of all, we regularize and turn this 
uh, trajectory data into a density, and then we are going to uh, uh, turn the occupant measure and then the density, and we learn from this object. And this is a uh, convergence of the objective function, and this is a learned velocity under the neural network parameterization, and this is the predicted density at the final stage from the PD. So what's nice here is ODE PD coupling because you can go back to the ODE and uh, produce trajectories. Here we add a little bit intrinsic noise. And then what's also even nice is now you have an ODE, you have a PD, we can do uncertainty quantification because the PD naturally give you the range of confident interval. So the confident interval purely come from solving the PD with the same density. And we can also do the same thing with the whole thruster data from uh, HET is a real life data. And the similar, we do time delay embedding, find the occupation measure, find the velocity in neural network reconstruction. And then this is the dynamics and you can go back from time delayed coordinate to the time series and match the time series. So what's interesting here is um, the training data and the test data, they are uh, separate disjoint. So it's similar to the machine learning setup. Uh, so finally, I just want to point out there's no free, I, I well recognize there's limitation for this approach. The so number one difficulty is non-uniqueness. So for example, the true uh, van der Poel velocity is what uh, we see in the second row, but what we learned is on the first row. They don't look anywhere by close, but they produce very similar uh, invariant property. So the bottom one is uh, uh, van der Poel with the without diffusion and with the diffusion, and the one above is what we reconstruct. Although they give us exactly the same invariant property, but uh, still the velocity are pretty different from each other. So we definitely need to study more in terms of the uniqueness in this respect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention. I will just do a quick conclusion. The main idea is to really turn an ODE learning problem to a PD learning problem. And the sweet spot is when they meet at the invert measure, even if I have only one single trajectory. There's still a lot we need to understand, especially there are technically two inverse problems on the ODE side and on the PD side. So their uh, well postness extensive unity and stability in each way need to have a like, full understanding and more importantly when these two meet it's also a sweet spot we want to find out yeah thank you very much thank you.